All right, so let's go. So I already told you that I wanted to talk about shape changes and um, inspired by um, um, passive motions in uh, plant systems. I will talk quickly, briefly about some typical uh, architecture that can trigger those kinds of movements. And my talk will be mainly on the a collaboration uh, I'm, I'm doing with chemists, where we try to um, look at specific sh uh, shape changes. So is my outline, first biological inspiration, uh, some architectures, and then uh, those diffusion-driven systems. So. Um, I mean, Peter already mentioned it a little bit, John and uh, Vanessa in her talk, so it will be quick. So not everybody knows, but uh, actually plants do move. And um, if you're very patient, you might see even growth movement or from day to day, like here in this case of tendril perversions, uh, where it's typically the time scales of a matter of hours. Then if we, um, if we are a little bit more impatient, then the pine cones only takes about 10 to 15 minutes. To, if you take a dry one and uh, to close inside a glass of water. And there are some really, really fast ones that we even need high speed camera to really see uh, what's the movement like, like the Venus flytrap that will snap as a mosquito of the right size is entering it. And we can divide them so in two categories maybe gro um, so the growth, uh, growth movement and the actuation movement. And um, Growth movement are maybe a little bit more tricky because you have biology involved, uh, whereas in uh, especially the passive actuators, uh, those are the um, best uh, potential to be copied. Another quick idea is this idea of hierarchy that uh, you already uh, heard in the biological talk. So actually, we are, I mean, all of us are familiar with the idea. All you need is. Uh, a lot of Lego, uh, some motivated kids or even parents, and this is what you can do with, uh, with it. So build some structures. Or, I mean, you only need to look at uh, macro scale architecture, skyscrapers, building, uh, to see that you often have a primary structure, a secondary structure, uh, etc. So the only thing that nature does better than us is it, uh, that the Lego blocks themselves are actually structures, and so it goes deeper uh, until the uh, so the fibers, then the cell walls with the microfibril angle, and even the, the configuration of the of the cellulose. Um, okay, so then the the pine cone is a typical example of uh, of a structure that is uh, dead, but that still is able to react to the environment. Um, so really quickly, we see that uh, this was already mentioned by by Peter that the microfibril angle uh, is actually the the, des the design variable that will tune the behavior of uh, every one of these individual scales. So if you look at the top of the scale, you see that the fibers are more, uh, more or less longitudinal, so you have no expansion in this direction. And if you look at the bottom, then you have um, approximately perpendicular fibers, so you have maximal extension, and this is typ a typical bilayer uh, bending effect. So this, I this idea of biological inspiration is just that uh, we are able to, or we could be able to control uh, the sh change of shapes just by playing with the internal strains. So how and where does the structure changes its internal uh, volumes? So internal strains, this is what I mean by this uh, weird world eigenstrains. So eigenstrains is just something to tell you that it could be actually triggered by different, uh, uh, several different sources. So in the pinecone example, it was a simple swelling. Um, the bilayers, often uh, thermostat examples, use uh, thermal expansion. And uh, we saw also in the smart material, in the talk about smart material, uh, that phase transformation can be also used to trigger shape changes. So actually any physical phenomenon that um, leads to volume change. So let's go to some eigenstrain architectures briefly. So here again, this bilayer idea. So it's really old. I think in, it was invented by a Swiss uh, uh, clock maker uh, even before that. But the first uh, scientific paper about it is from Timoshenko uh, almost 100 years ago. And what we have is if you have a differential expansion um, in the cross section between uh, here the black that uh, wants to swell and, uh, and the white one that is just passively resisting, then you will have a uh, creation of curvature. And we have several examples. Um, I mean, actually, really a lot. But here, yeah, I just uh, show you a few. And 
some are natural, some artificial. So the, you already uh, saw them briefly. We have the pine cone, that is one example. We have the wheat on where it's a little bit different because actually here the bilayer effect is localized here near the seed. So all this antenna is uh, actually not bending. The bending is localized here, but it's just amplifying the bending. Um, we have this rather, rather complicated looking example of uh, ice plant seed capsule that Vanessa presented, but that in the end, when you uh, reduce the system, simplify the system, turns out to be a simple bilayer activated by those skills against a more complicated, uh, I mean, geometrically complicated, but from the mechanics, it's uh, the same. And artificial, so with the colleague of mine at some, uh, summer school, we wanted to design a um, maquette that uh, reacts to humidity changes. So just by buying uh, uh, thin wood strips and gluing them with uh, plastic uh, uh, sh uh, shapes, we uh, have this like um, model of an umbrella that could uh, unfold when it rains. And I mean, it worked at this scale. Of course, this, the big question of the system is how can we scale them up? And another example, that uh, it's a German architect, Achim Menges, that um, created the system that actually surprisingly looks very similar to, this, to, this, to those ice plants, even though it's not uh, uh, related. Um, so it's a hygroscope system where you have also wood active uh, layers attached to plastic passive layers that open and close with changes of, on humidity. And it's uh, it parts of the permanent exposition at Centre Pompidou in Paris and this scale of approximately one meter. So this is one idea, just bilayer systems. And then once we have bilayers, actually what we can do, if I find the mouse, is we can stack them on top of each other. So here the colors change, it's pink for active and uh, green for, for passive. And so just by changing the mirror plane of this bilayer along, along the structure, we're able to do um, local bending, but with rotation, so it's actually uh, some kind of twisting motion um, like this. But this is actually uh, maybe not so surprising that if you have a, a one-dimensional long, stru long structure, like type of bar structure, but if you play with the three-dimensional uh, strains inside of it, that you can match a different shape. So um, actually I wrote a, an algorithm that uh, enables to look at, uh, uh, to explore the space of, uh, of uh, shape changes. So for example, using a simple square cross section and cutting it in a, a couple of domains, assigning some materials uh, with different assignment algo algorithms algorithm, um, to it, meshing it and just using finite element, uh, looking at the deformation. So here in red, we have the active parts that in case uh, of a helicoidal arrangement, as I showed before, do this uh, helix. And if you do something random, well, you get random in the end. So this is maybe not so surprising, but it shows you that you have freedom of uh, doing uh, different shape changes. But uh, when we had that, we wanted to look also at, uh, at this in a more systematic way. So instead of um, having the freedom of uh, changing along the structure, we said, let's look at extrudable cross sections. So just taking square cross sections that uh, with a certain distribution of active and passive layers inside of it and seeing uh, what kind of, of movement can we have. So here in this uh, chart, um, I show that for a square cross section, here we see the symmetry. So the mi uh, there are four mirror planes and uh, one uh, rotation axis. And in this line here, I will then put um, um, a material distribution inside of it. So a contrast of active and passive. And in the different lines, I, uh, I see that I can here keep the symmetry by just putting a square inside the square. So, I mean, there is not so much that could happen here. Or break it down, for example, by just, keep, just keeping here the rotational axis or just keeping a, a mirror plane uh, or two, a two mirror plane here and so on and so on. So this idea was based on Curie's principle that uh, effects have at least uh, the symmetry of their causes. So because we, at the time we didn't really know uh, what would lead to what kind of motion, we just tried to restrict the symmetry space. So another way to present it is putting the, 
the fully symmetric in the middle and then just keeping the mirror plane around it. And if you take one of this, uh, one of this cross section and rotate it four times around, uh, around this axis, then you generate those, uh, those uh, families of cross sections. And the results from the finite element, um, actually we saw that having a, having a structure with a rotational axis is not enough to actually uh, observe rotation. In this case, uh, even for very high contrast between the black expanding and the white uh, resisting zones, uh, nothing was happening, just stretching. But if instead of uh, having a closed cross section, I allow for having some kind of uh, wings, then we see that it's uh, able to create uh, a twist. And this twist can be tuned just by playing with the geometry of the, of the wings, like uh, from a, um, you know, a rather small in inertia would lead to a high twist, uh, and a, a high inertia would lead to a small twist. Interestingly, this one in the end uh, also doesn't, doesn't work. Um, so then we wanted to see, I mean, now we would like to see if this is only on, uh, on computer, or if this works also in reality. So um, uh, luckily, we have the chance to collaborate with James Weaver uh, from uh, Harvard that is able to print uh, multi-materials. So in this case, he, uh, he's able to print materials uh, from uh, one megapascal to one gigapascal. And so we decided to print this, uh, this twisters. Uh, Actually, in this example, the, um, the soft part is in the middle and the hard part are on the side because first we wanted to use pressure to activate it. Um, but reading the, the safety data sheet of uh, this material, which is polyurethane, they said, don't put it in acetone, it works well. We said, perfect, we put it in acetone. And what we observe here is some uh, helical uh, deformation. So it's not this twisting that we had before because it's the opposite. Uh, distribution of soft and, and, and hard, but it's showing that it works. And we are currently working on measuring the properties of this uh, a little bit in more detail. Um, so I gave you some examples. I mean, show you the biological inspiration, gave you some examples of eigenstrain architectures. And now I come to the main part of my talk, namely those uh, diffusion driven systems. So first, before actually going into that, I just want to give you uh, uh, to talk to you uh, and to show you this uh, example. Um, so what, w what will happen for a bilayer if instead of having uh, a very long dimension and being thin, it's actually something that is, uh, has two dimensions, so where the length and the width are comparable. So it's still a rectangle, let's say, but the, the width is, uh, is not uh, too small. Which one of those two shapes uh, will it bend? Will it bend in the log direction or will it bend along the short direction? Uh, actually, it turns out it's not so, it's not so easy to answer. Um, I mean, trying to look at it just from an energetical perspective, uh, we all know that it's much easier to bend a piece of paper than to turn a piece of paper into a football, because it's uh, actually this is a little bit what this expression is telling you, that when the thickness of the, of the layer th is thin, then because the uh, stretching energy goes with the, uh, is linear with the thickness and the bending energy is to the power of third with the thickness, then it's actually much easier to bend it than to stretch it. But if we look at those two configurations uh, from this, let's look at the stretching content. So if we take a spiral like this and just show this uh, from the top, we have a uh, stretching in all this direction. Uh, so this one, and in this case, we have stretching along this direction. So that's what I show here. But it turns out that it's exactly the same area, so they have the same stretching content. Now, if we look at the we look at the second uh, contribution, bending, uh, we have bending along uh, the long direction, and so it's also the same. Um, so it's not really explaining it. And actually, this was solved pretty recently, not by me, but by Alben in the literature, that shows that in this uh, energy map. Um, so in red, you have the Timoshenko solution where it's just bended in one direction and uh, straight in the other one. That actually you have a release along the, along the borders, so it's the boundary layer effect. And because the spiral shape has a longer border than the cigar shape, then it releases more energy. And so that's why it's, it's favored. So it's not so trivial as uh, one might think um, at first. And yeah, on this picture, you see here that the border is actually a little bit do double curved to release the stretching energy. So now let's me come to the system um, we're studying. So um, 
It's, uh, so Leonid Dionov from Dresden came, actually came to us with, uh, with, those, uh, uh, with those systems. So it's made by uh, photolithography and um, it's a thermoresponsive bilayer. So you have one uh, passive layer on top, PMMA, that doesn't react to, uh, to water, doesn't swell with water, even with changes of, of temperature. And on the bottom, you have another polymer, NIPAM, that actually swells uh, about 10% uh, when we switch above a critical temperature, this temperature can also be tuned by playing with the with the chemical uh, composition of the of the solvent. Um, so, for example, here they they tuned it so that it's close to uh, for biomat for biomedical applications maybe. And um, so, what happens is when we switch the temperature, then the um, the green layer is, uh, starts to expand. Um, and we have a, a bending that, uh, that occurs. And here I've written diffusion because actually we will see that the substrate plays a very important role in the, in the system um, because really the, the, the swelling starts from the edges and then slowly diffuses inside. So uh, we looked at two kinds of shapes, uh, rectangles and, and stars. I, I didn't say before. No, okay. So the typical dimensions, uh, it's like uh, one, one to two micrometers thick and here 500 micrometers uh, wide. So let me talk first about rectangles. So here's the experimental, uh, the experimental results where uh, we try to look systematically at, at shapes um, from uh, 1000 micrometer to 125 micrometer squares and going to rectangle by decrease by increasing the aspect ratio from uh, you know one to two to four then to eight and um, so I don't want you to look at uh, all these pictures uh, in details now but in um, in this in this uh, uh, what we observed actually is that um, there is a trend if you uh, if you're along the diagonal so if you have something that is square shaped Depend, I mean, if your radius of curvature, which is approximately 10 micrometer, is approximately the same size of, as your, is not too small compared to your, to your length, then you will have some, some imperfections, some diagonal breaking. If it's very much shorter than your dimensions, then you will have, we observe all side bending. But what's interesting now is that if we take a very elongated shape, we see that we have this long side uh, rolling that wins. And uh, so if you remember what I explained just previously, it's exactly the opposite uh, as for a free bilayer. So that's, in, that's kind of interesting. So it means that, um, that's, the, I mean, the only thing we didn't consider yet is this uh, diffusion aspect of it. So now we have diffusion and actuation. So, you know, being an engineer, it's like, oh no, it's a couple problem, it's complicated. But, uh, good news is that uh, when we look at the typical timescales of uh, diffusion, and actuation, we see that diffusion is, uh, you know, matter of seconds when for for the for this particular material, but uh, also, uh, yeah, often I think. Uh, whereas uh, actuation is is uh, the proportional to the speed of mechanical waves, so it's much much faster. So good news is we can decouple those two and just look at uh, uh, quasi statically at the at the actuation pattern. Um, so here I'm, I'm going to try to give uh, just an uh, argument to explain you why the, sh why the long side rolling is actually winning. So if we take a rectangle like this and uh, keeping in, I mean, taking again this, this kind of energetical uh, expression for it, we just activate the, the border a little bit. So we stop at the, at the early time point and we say, okay, the, after switching the temperature, the water diffused uh, a distance uh, D. And uh, here, AD is simply the area of, uh, of this uh, crown around it. And uh, so if it's flat, now it's a double stretch area. So it's very costly in energy. And now if we say that we uh, allow it to roll along the long side like this, then we can subtract in yellow from, from AD the, those two contributions. Um, and then we only have those uh, small red areas as double stretching. And if we allow the other way, if we allow only the short side rolling to start, then uh, we get uh, this, uh, this contribution. And because L is bigger than W, 
uh, we see that the short, the long side rolling scenario in the beginning seems to be more optimal energetically speaking than the than the short side rolling, even though in the end it's the other one. So by finite element calculation, actually, I found um, this behavior again, but only for an aspect ratio of approximately four. So meaning if I um, if I take something shorter than this, then it's still the short side is somehow winning. But um, actually, to be to be really accurate, the, the, here the substrate is. Uh, I mean, the thing is curling down on the side, which is not really physical. So maybe that's why the solution is is uh, uh, is not real. But for for long aspect ratio, if we only activate the crown, I found that the long side rolling is uh, effectively winning. So the conclusion of this rectangles means that history matters. So if you take a bilayer expanding in two directions, if you uh, activate the bottom layer instantaneously, then you get the, the spiral, just like Timoshenko, Pinecone, I mean, all these examples. But if you activate it uh, progressively from the side, actually, you get the other solution. This is kind of interesting. Now, if we go to stars, uh, more interesting shapes. Uh, just let you watch the video. We see that the, the actuation process is uh, is way more complicated uh, than, than than for rectangles, and um, so we see different different patterns. And what's uh, even more, we see that there are, there are different steps in the actuation. So just to check again this argument of uh, separation of time scales. Here, actually, on this video, we see in we see a slight contrast here in between light blue and dark blue, and this is the diffusion front. We see progressing, and so it's like speed of seconds, and here's the actuation, for example, where it reaches a certain point, which is speed of milliseconds, so it's confirmed the, 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 the decoupling. So as I said, we have different steps in the actuation process, so we start from more rounded edge, uh, edged uh, stars that uh, pretty quickly formed this uh, pointy, uh, sharp edges stars, and after a certain time, they they will um, uh, bu uh, buckle. I mean, fold really uh, quickly into a variety of different shapes. Um, so for the experimentalist observed this one has the highest probability of uh, appearance, actually. So how can we understand this? So it's if we look at one of the wings um, separately, we can. Uh, uh, so differentiate those two steps. So one first step, uh, as I said, where the, the curved corner uh, form tubes, straight tubes. Um, and then a second step after, after a given time where those, uh, those wings will, will fold. So the tube formation. Um, so here on the left, you see uh, three abacus modelization, a finite element uh, simulation of uh, a crown that it's that is a uh, constraint on the inside and where the red part so the bottom part is expanding uh, isotropically and the top part is just a passive uh, uh, elastically resisting to it and um, d is the dimension of the is the size of the crown and we see that as we increase the size of the crown the number of wrinkles so n here is uh, actually decreasing so that's also what is uh, shown in this graph that uh, for, uh, yeah, exactly that. The number of wrinkles is inverse, inversely proportional to the activation depth. So interestingly, this, this argument actually was, um, um, I mean, they came to us with this, I, with this system and uh, I said, oh, you should see wrinkling. And then they said, oh yeah, actually we do. So it was funny that because it showed that the theory was uh, working. And uh, also another, so another question we had in the experiment is that uh, at some point it stops. So, for example, if you start with a circle and you switch temperature, it will start to wrinkle from the sides, and but it won't just like simulation wrinkle and wrinkle until it's like maybe flapping in two. It will stop for uh, um, here a given angle, a critical angle of 130 degrees, um, for example. And um, I mean this we don't quite understand completely now, but I think it's when the bilayer touches the um, the flat part again that it stops. So this wrinkling here is a um, torn plastic bag where you see this fractal wave. I mean, if you have, a, yeah, if you take a plastic bag and you tear it, then on the size uh, along the fracture, you will have a plastification uh, uh, strains that will lead to excessive edge uh, length. And here you see this fractal, uh, this fractal wave that you can also see in in, in vegetable in uh, lettuce, uh, vegetables, or clothes or something. 
Um, and it's confirmed by, by the experiments. We see here at different time points that the number of wrinkles uh, here is very small. We don't really see. Here we start to see them. Here we can actually start to count them. And at some point, they, they stop. Um, OK, so this is actually the, our understanding of the first step. So we understand the wrinkling. There's the stopping condition is, uh, is not completely solved yet. The second step is um, imagine now you have one of the wings that was first curved and that's, that now has uh, uh, tubes around its sides. So actually, it's, it's much more difficult to bend it along a line like this, horizontal line like this. But if you uh, look at those points connecting to the next wing, they, are like, they act like as weak points. And um, the, the assumption we have is that uh, the folding appears always along the lines connecting uh, two of, uh, so straight line connecting two of those weak points. And so also by, by finite element, it's, it actually makes sense that uh, the bending here is much, much higher than the bending along uh, um, another line. And um, so we see this way that we can, from a, from a 2D structure, form a 3D uh, uh, pyramids. So the conclusion of this part is a bit similar to the one with the rectangle is that history matters. So you can have past dependency. If you take a bilayer like this and you activate it homogeneously, it will get a, you will get a continuous um, bending. But if you activate it in steps, so first you create some tubes on the side and then uh, you let it diffuse to the center, you will get a completely different uh, end result. Um, so yeah, as I showed before in simulation, we can, um, also tuned, so it's a little bit uh, uh, RT, uh, you know, experimentally, but tune the dimension so to form a perfect uh, uh, 3D pyramid from 2D simple bilayers just by using this uh, progressive diffusion uh, from the side. Uh, okay, and sometimes, so if you if we play with other dimensions, we can have conflict because. Um, for example, here we start with a curved shape. We have this uh, straight edge forming. We can count here the different uh, so weak points here: one, two, three, four, five, six, so on. And maybe because of imperfections, the material little changes in diffusion. One of the wings will start to fold, and the folding will uh, then uh, erase those two weak points. So basically, once this wing has folded, then those two cannot fold anymore. So the the next possible one is this one, and uh, that's what we see here. And then the next possible one would be this one. And so this explains also why this is the most observed uh, pattern. So come to the conclusion. Um, so analyzing you know, plant motion gives us this, this uh, idea that we can play with uh, uh, swelling, differential swelling properties inside structures to uh, sh change their shape. But what I showed also in, in those examples that you can introdu introduce this heterogeneity, this mismatch and swelling, not only by the architecture of properties, but also by uh, the history of uh, the activation of your structure. And this way, even with very simple bilayers, uh, you can achieve rather complex, uh, complex movements, uh, as I showed uh, with the pyramids and, and stuff. So with this, I'd like to uh, so thank uh, thanks the biomaterial department. Uh, I mean the people I'm I'm collaborating with, and especially Peter Fratzel and John Dunlop, uh, Yves Brechet for taking me as a PhD student, James Weaver for uh, our interactions and, and printing, and of course for what I presented right now, the the team from Dresden under Leonid Dionov and uh, Georgie who uh, um, who did all the experiments and and so on and. Um, uh, last but not least, if, uh, if we don't find an uh, immediate application of those kind of, of systems, at least it's pretty. Yeah. <laughs>